We've got Jake Charlotte and Ben Garnett from Select Plant Hire. They're going to talk to us tonight about uh, tall buildings and climbing cranes. And it sounds really exciting to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't, yeah. I'm sure there's, uh, yeah, significant challenges. And uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how those are, are overcome. So yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Ben and Jake, for taking the time out to, to come and talk to us. So uh, in, term, yeah, in terms of questions, I think they're quite happy to take questions as, as we go along. Um, but during the presentation, if you can keep your, your microphones off and your video off as well, just to help with um, the presentation and bandwidth. But if you want to ask a question, just come off uh, mute and show yourself if you want and ask a question. If, if there's something you want to leave to the end, you can always put it in the chat function as well. And we'll pick that up at, at the end. Um, so, all right, over to you, uh, Jake and Ben. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I thought we'd just start by introducing ourselves. So I'm Ben Garnett. I'm the senior lifting engineer for Select Tower Cranes. Yeah, and I'm uh, Jake Charlotte. I'm the engineering manager for Select Lifting Solutions. So thanks for coming along. I hope you enjoy the presentation. So first of all, a bit about what Select do. So Select cover quite a wide range of areas from lifting solutions to site electronics. So our main two business streams are really lifting solutions. So anything from tower cranes, crawler cranes and so on. So we have about 200 plus tower cranes in our fleet and over 60 crawlers, I believe. Um, other areas such as site accommodation are things like um, modular buildings for welfare and um, any cabins on site. We, we supply quite a lot of them as well. Myself and Jake are both work in the lifting solutions area, but more specifically the tower crane division. Okay, so a bit about our team and what we do in the technical department of lifting solutions. Um, when a, a client's looking to, well, really from the early design stage of a building, um, looking to get planning permission and initial buildability, we'll get involved in um, early engagement with them, actually looking at what cranes they need um, and where the cranes would be best positioned to come up with the best strategy. And um, quite often we find that, you know, if, if a client's gone ahead with an idea, there would have been a struggle at the end to actually get the crane package to work. So it's really key to making sure structures are buildable to get the early engagement going. And the same, you know, early engagement with main contractors. So when a main contractor is tendering for a, a structure, they'll bring us on board early to make sure that our craneage can uh, provide what they require. We do obviously the, the technical planning, the suite of drawings, load information, everything that's required to submit our tender and then once we win the project there's the ongoing support and um, to actually deliver the tower crane scheme we select is the the uk dealer for terex crane manufacturer for tower cranes so we also provide technical consulting for other tower crane owners who we sell terex cranes to we also within select we do lots of planning for mobile cranes crawler cranes and hoist schemes <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about tall buildings specifically so what is a tall what actually is a tall building so a tall building to us is any, anything over 150 meters in height and up to sort of 250 meters you have skyscrapers and then 300 meters plus you have what's known as a super tall so in the uk we have two super talls there's the shard and there is 22 bishop's cape I'm just going to run through a few past projects we've had now um, on skyscrapers and super talls. So obviously you've all seen this one, the Shard, 310 metres. We had the cranes on there. 122 Leadenhall Street, also known as the Cheese Grater or the Leadenhall Building in London, 225 metres. 52 Lime Street, London, also known as the Scalpel, 190 metres. Newfoundlands and Canary Wharf at 220 metres and then on the left of that we also had the One Bank Street project. Not so, not so tall, um, I think the, the highest crane was actually 144 metres on this project um, but we had 21 cranes, most of which were tying and climbing very close together as you can see 
So that um, at Southbank Place, obviously just outside the London Eye, and um, that brought significant challenges. So on to the climbing methods that we use within Select. So there's three main climbing methods that we can use. So there's external climbing, internal climbing, which is climbing inside a structure, and also HD19 climbing, which is a specialist climbing equipment developed by Terex for um, lift shafts, so the core of the structure. The most common we'll use in the UK is external climbing. So we thought we'd just quickly run through how you externally climb a crane. So timing climbing is the process on how we get the cranes to build high rise towers. Climbing is quite a high risk operation as it involves putting the crane into balance and disconnecting the top of the crane from the mass sections. At Select, we are one of the most experienced in the UK for climbing cranes. So the first part of climbing a crane is to install the climbing frame. That's the big red frame that sits around the mass section. So the climbing frame comes as a C-section and a flat plate. So the, the C-section is lifted on in one go by the crane and then the flat plate sits on the other section, other side, where the tray is installed. So you can see on the first picture there, that's what we call the tray. And this is where the mass section that we will climb into the crane sits. So once we've installed the climbing frame, we then climb it up to what we call P-beams. These sit just directly below, below the slew ring. Once we've pinned it to the slew, once we've pinned it to the P-beams, we then climb, install a mass section on the tray. Once the mass section is installed on the tray, we then lift another mass section onto the hook block. This mass section acts as a balance weight. So once we've got the crane into balance, i.e. the back and the front of the, the counter jib and the front of the crane are perfectly balanced, we can start the climbing operation. So the climbing operation involves using a ram which is installed on the back of the climbing frame. So the ram engages into what we call climbing lugs. These are sat on two of the mast legs. The mast legs are made up of H steel pieces or I-beams. Within the I-beams are climbing lugs. The ram will sit into these climbing lugs and then push up from these climbing lugs. So the climb, every, every push of the ram is 1.5 metres. Every 1.5 metres, we will then push a chock in to support the entire weight of the top of the crane and the climbing, the climbing frame while we retract the ram. After we've climbed up just over six metres, we are able to climb in one of our six metre sections. So we slide this in from the tray. This slides in across and then we then can either lower the crane and bolt it back to the slew ring or continue the operation as in put another mass section on the tray and continue climbing out. During the climbing operation, we exceed the maximum freestanding height of the crane, so we have to tie the crane back to the structure. In order for us to do this, we need to install a collar which sits around the mass section. This comes again in two C pieces, so as you can see from the first picture there, that's the first C piece being installed. Once the collar is installed, we then can look at putting the tie legs in. The tie legs are the things that connect the crane back to the structure. So there's many different ways we can tie the crane back to the structure, but the most common is a vertical bracing column. As you can see from the third picture along, this spans between two floor levels. The small picture on the top right is a top of slab connection. The middle picture is a, a slab edge connection. And then the bottom picture is a core wall connection. Between the two, it is core walls or vertical bracing columns that we're often tighter. So during the climbing operation, well, prior to the climbing operation, we work closely with the client to find the most cost effective way to construct the building. So there's several different construction methods that you can use in the UK. This is jump form, slip form, floor by floor. There's a few other different methods in there as well, but the most common are jump form and slip form, as you can see from the two um, drawings either side. Another common factor these days is safety screens. These often sit on the top three or four levels and prevent us from tying to these levels because we can't get past them with our ties to go back to the vertical bracing columns. We also have to consider su details such as cladding because we need to avoid it to go through the windows so that we can tie back into vertical bracing columns. Other things that affect climbs are things like crane model. So if it's a smaller crane, so a 12 ton machine, we can climb it a lot higher above what we call what the tie and collar than we can a, a 32 ton machine. 
So when we have done the climbing sequence, we then have to look at the tie sequence. So as you can see there from the first, first drawing there, that's a four tie log configuration, which spans back to vertical brazen columns. And we've had to avoid all cladding mullions and go through the windows, as you can see there. The middle one is a core, deep core wall connection, which is a three tie log configuration. And that's used on, often on slip form construction where the car goes up first and the floors follow behind at a later date. The furthest on the right is a 17 metre tie configuration, which again spans back to vertical bracing columns, but they're special ties because they were 17 metres long. We calculate all the tie loads from, we get what we call collar loads from Terex, which are the acting loads around the um, square section of the mast. We then have to implement this into a stress analysis program called STRAP, which we can then produce the tie leg loads, which are what directly impacts the building design. There are alternatives to tying and climbing, which are becoming more popular um, these days, as climbing is a high risk opera operation and also takes quite a bit of time out of your program. We can eliminate tying climbs using mass sections called HD33, which are reinforced mass sections, as you can see at the base of the crane on the left hand side. That crane there is a CTL 430, which is a 24 tonne machine, which is erected to 104.9 metres, which is 0.1 of a metre off the tallest freestanding crane in the UK at the moment. However, it is by far the biggest freestanding crane with a capacity of 24 tonne. This saved the project one time climb, which is about £50,000 plus the temporary works aspect of it. On the right hand side there is what we call a wedge system. So wedging is also an alternative time climbing, but this is used when the crane is inside the structure as we have to wedge all four corners, all four sides of the mast. Wedging is more commonly used to prevent, uh, to eliminate the deflection or reduce the deflection rather than increasing the height of the crane as it's more awkward to climb a crane using external methods internally in a, inside the building, if that makes sense. So when we've finished the time climb, or when we've finished the structure, we can either repeat the process in terms of the climbing, or reverse the process of the external climbing by climbing the sections back out and then reducing the height of the crane, or we can use what we call a derrick crane. So you can see there from the picture, that's a derrick crane erected on top of the walkie-talkie. The derrick crane is a 16-ton machine, which um, is, is able to be split down into components of 1.5 ton or less. A standard crane within our fleet, the slew ring varies from eight ton to about to 50 ton on our biggest crane. So you can see the, the size difference in terms of the slew ring on the, the derrick crane. It allows us to break that crane up and put it in a goods hoist rather than having to um, take it down with another crane. This is the Derrick crane working or finishing off the Shard project in London. So this crane, this Derrick crane took down a 16 ton TTL 180 machine, which was finishing off the Shard project. Thanks, Ben. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of uh, some of the challenges we had on the Newfoundlands project. This is a very challenging project um, from a time and climb perspective for any tower crane. So as you can see in the picture there, um, you know, the project was sort of partway complete and we had a couple of cranes on there at that time. It's now finished. It finished in 2019. Uh, the last crane came down um, and we learned a lot of lessons through this project. So just a bit of scope so that the structure is 220 metres high and we had final heights for the two cranes of 240 and 224 metres. The structure had a concrete core with concrete floors supported by a steel diagrid structure. We first started looking at the crane scheme in August 2013. And as I say, it, we took the final crane down in 2019 uh, towards the end of that year. So we, we looked at many different options. We looked at flat top type cranes, luffing jib tower cranes and multiple cranes of smaller sizes, so 16 ton capacity right up to using 40 ton capacity flat tops. So what were the key challenges we actually faced and why this project was a bit different? 
So if you look on the diagram on the right, um, this shows you sort of the typical sequence that the structure followed. Obviously, slight deviation occurred, but this is a general principle from start to finish. So starting at the top, you have the jump farm rig. Um, if I remember correctly, that, that was about four floors deep. So if you imagine you, you've got the top crane, it has to free slew and coordinate with the lower crane. Then you've got the four floors distance for the rig. There was then another four floors from the underside of the rig down to the top of the steel diagrid and another four floors back down to the what we call the node floor. So th this structure, due to the shape of the diagrid and the, um, the reinforcement within the floor slabs, you could only tie the cranes back to the node floor because the, the floors in between were significantly let, had significantly less strength and due to the construction, as you can see, those floors didn't come in until a lot later on, so they'd be far too low to connect the crane to and gain any height. So, as you can see, when the when the core jump form rig reaches the bottom of the low crane, that crane needs to climb. So there's a, a long distance from the top of the low crane down to the first node floor that's available to tie to. This was made even worse by the fact that the, the building followed a, what we call the quadrant style construction. So it followed a rotational spiral as it went up. So you, at some point you ended up where you were on the bad part of the spiral, meaning the node floor wasn't the top one there. It was actually eight floors below the top of the diagrid. So we, we needed a very high distance from the tie collar connection back to the structure to actually where the top of the crane needed to be. And it wasn't a matter of just climbing the crane six metres because then it would hit the other crane above it. You actually had to climb right above the other crane. So just to make things a little bit worse, um, when we got to the final height of the structure at 220 metres, we had a 25 metre gap between that and the airport radar profile for City Airport. So we had to fit both cranes within that space. And we also needed to lift 17 tonne columns around the structure. So our solutions for this. Um, to lift the 17 tonne columns, we uh, we ended up with two 32 tonne flat top tower cranes. These were very good, however, due to the size of them, it just wasn't possible to achieve the climbing performance and the height required above the collar to get the cranes up and complete the structure. So we were able to freestand these on our large um, six bolt mass sections to round about 85 metres. Um, this meant that we could get all of the 17 tonne columns installed up to level 15. Once these were installed, we used mobile cranes to dismantle the top of the cranes and re-erect them as 20 tonne flat tops. Due to the cranes being smaller and better balanced, the climbing performance was much better. This still wasn't enough, so we instructed a wind tunnel test report specific to the project location to be carried out. This confirmed the terrain category for the site as suburban, which meant that we could use more accurate wind information to actually analyse the loads on the crane. Because um, if you don't do this, you have to consider the crane effectively in plain terrain in flat open country. Um, so we did that. We also included, um, you can see the red sections on the diagram, they, they reinforce mass sections able to transfer more load through them. So the combination of those things it meant we were able to achieve up to 64 metres above a tie collar at any given time. And we completed the structure with eight ties and climbs for one crane and nine for the other. We then, as you can see there, we squeezed both cranes in very tight between the radar profile and the top of the structure. Um, along the way, we also had to go back to the client and discuss a few points where I don't think there's a tower crane in existence that would be able to achieve it. So we work very closely with the, the client to adjust their construction program in certain places as we were able to demonstrate that's what had to happen to make the scheme work. So now I've just got a quick time lapse video just to show you uh, the project. There's a the Newfoundlands project and also on the left hand side there's the One Bank Street project which we also had the cranes on.